Hi, welcome back to SPF 23 Virtual. And a big welcome to those of you joining us just now. I'm Carrie Ann Cardinal, your host for this panel, Storytelling on the Land, an Indigenous global perspective, supported by signature partner, Telephone Canada. Today I'm tuning in from the unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish and Musqueam nations. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you're not sure, you can check out the site native-land.ca. Just some housekeeping before we start. I'd like to highlight that there's French translation available for this session. So kindly toggle the French language button, which is the global icon at the bottom of your screen, if you desire. You're free to mute your original audio or keep it on. We'll have a brief Q&A at the end of the session, so please feel free to add any of your questions to the Q&A chat box. Today, we'll hear from filmmakers and storytellers from the global community who will share their sustainability journey in film, TV, and entertainment while exploring their Indigenous roots and traditions. I'm so excited to welcome our guests from very different corners of the world. But before we start, just a video message from Telefilm Canada and some opening remarks from Ken Pru, Director of Event Management at Telefilm Canada. Telefilm Canada champions independent storytelling in Canada that is sustainable and inclusive. We are inspired by Indigenous creators on the value of connecting story, land and language and of protecting our natural world. Our commitment is to work through the lens of sustainability in all we do. As an investor, a promoter, a financial administrator and as an employer, we will make positive change and reduce our impact by encouraging knowledge sharing working in partnership with the industry to implement best practices, establishing science-based targets, and measuring our carbon footprint. With tools like our modernized budget template that now includes sustainability and EDI priorities and our sustainability plan template requirement, we strive to encourage sustainable productions. Together, we can build a sustainable and future-facing film industry. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. I'm Ken Peru, like was just mentioned, Director of Event Management at Telefilm Canada. I'm super happy to be here. I'll keep this brief because I know everybody wants to get straight to the content, but it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this panel, Storytelling on the Land, an Indigenous Global Perspective. Year after year, this forum allows us to come together, collaborate, and learn from each other. Telefilm Canada has been a proud partner of SPF since 2021, and we appreciate that this platform shines a light on our collective priority of working together towards a greener, more inclusive, and healthier future for our industry. Thank you, Melanie, and her team for their good work. At Telefilm, our commitment has been inspired by Indigenous perspectives. Their holistic and inclusive lens remind us that story, land, and language are harmoniously intertwined. Surrounded here by Indigenous global champions, we look forward to increasing our understanding. I want to take a moment to share that just last week, Telefilm launched its Indigenous Reconciliation Plan. This plan has been in the works for two years and is now available on our website. Learning how to better support Indigenous story storytellers would not be possible without the guidance and conversations we have with Indigenous creators and partners. We now better understand the power of collaboration and the need to continue working together. So to all of them, I say thank you. I also want to mention that the second iteration of our Eco-Awareness Survey Report was published today, and there are some inspiring results. Please visit our website to learn more. To better support greener production practices, Telefilm is taking a thoughtful, informed, and pragmatic approach. One of the practical approaches was making a sustainability plan, a mandatory deliverable for all successful Telefilm applicants. The need to better plan is critical to success. To help our producers with this task, we also created an interactive sustainability plan template, and we revised our production budget template. And recently, we've updated our production program. Productions with budgets of $3.5 million or higher are required to use carbon calculator to calculate their production's greenhouse gas emissions and report on their carbon footprint. Telfilm will continue to support changes that encourage greener production practices. Impl implementing change to reach net zero takes a concentrated global effort, and we are all in this together. Now, I'm going to pass it to our uh, Telfilm Indigenous Initiatives lead and content analyst Adriana Chartron, who is the moderator for today's panel. Thank you so much, everyone. Merci beaucoup. Enjoy the session. So hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, as Ken said, my name is Adriana Chartrand, and I'm the lead of Indigenous Initiatives and a content analyst with Telefilm Canada. 
I'm a mixed race native woman. My dad's Red River Métis from the community of St. Laurent in Manitoba and my mom's white. I am originally from Winnipeg, Manitoba on the prairies and I'm now based in Toronto. So to get started, I'm gonna throw to our panelists to please introduce themselves. So just who you are and a little bit about what you do. Maybe we can start with Libby. Uh, tēnā tātou. Kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, he uru ia hau ona te kapu manawa whiti. Um, I come from a place where we usually introduce our rivers, our mountains and our homeland. So I'm going to do that. Um, my waka, my canoe is Tainui waka. My river is Ōtaki. My mountain or my maunga is the Tararua Ranges. And my marae, the gathering place of my people, is Te Pō o Tainui. E mihi ana ki a koutou katoa. Um, those are the things that we say when we do introduce ourselves. We don't say my name is. We say my river is, my mountain is, and my gathering place is. And in this forum today, that reminds me um, every day when we introduce ourselves that, that we are only there on this land, on my land or your land, for a short period of time. And that's incumbent on us to remember those things. So just even uttering uh, my introduction reminds me of the places that I need to protect. So imihi ana ki a koutou katoa. Thanks, Libby. We'll go to uh, Hirona. Morina, Joanna. Mihi nui ki a koe. A te mari e te whānau a ko Hirona e nā re toku ingoa in the land of the long white cloud where uh, Libby I just spoke and just met and Tainui is. Um, and I, yeah, I I live just in the village next door to Tainui and, and Libby. And um, it's very true that when we when we introduce ourselves, we're really introducing our environment around us and, and by doing that, being grateful to everything in the moment of our time of birth. And it also links us to our ancestors as well. Um, so in saying that, um, ko Tararua Te Maunga, ko Tainui Te Waka, um, ko Hiwana Toku Ingoa, um, Ngā Te Rākaua, Ngā Te Huia, um, Murupoko. Um, I have the privilege, I'm not sure what Tainu is looking at right now, but um, I'm looking out here through the window and I can see the Tararua Mountains and I get to see that every morning. And um, it's a privilege for a lot of our Indigenous people and, and Indigenous filmmakers to be actually on their land and to live on their land and to be walking the land every day. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you. I look forward to hearing what everyone else is going to share. I'm going to learn today. It's going to be great. Kia ora. Tanui, do you want to go? Uh, kia ora koutou. Um... Hiona was right. I was looking out the window and uh, we can see the mountain ranges that we're talking about not far away. Um, hi, everybody. I'm here to one of Kia Kutu, Kia Tari Film. Ki te ra wahanga o Turtle Island. O te rai ia ki ngai ui take take o te wā tēnā kutu katoa. Uh, my name is Tainui Stevens. I'm a, a screen producer, writer, director, um, based and living in Aotearoa, New Zealand. My tribe is of the far north of the country, the Tararua people, and I'm descended from a mountain called Whangatauatia, from uh, a river called Wainui, and from an ocean called the Taio Faro. Uh, and as I think about that, um, these aspects of nature and our environment are truly sustainable because they're so enduring. And much of our thinking is in line with the enduring nature and the sustainability of our environment. And we use ritual and our relationship with our environment to do what we do. Uh, so, kia ora koutou. Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Lisa. Kura ehket, pohkaite, mullan reht reht johanna sareino Lisa. Teik peroula kare reino Lisa. Hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Holmberry. And uh, we are introducing us according our ancestors. So I'm introducing me according my 
father's side ancestor and my grandmother's side ancestor. So I'm I'm living in the Sapmi. In at the moment, I'm in Finland. We in Sa Sapmi Samiland is we are in the three di uh, four different countries: Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Russia. I am working in the Arctic Indigenous Film Fund and uh, our activities uh, are focusing in the environment, the indigenous knowledge and land rights, and sharing the knowledge of climate change, which is hitting us so much in up in the Arctic, also in the Antarctic and the south, southern hemisphere. We are... Uh, Recording in progress. And we are also supporting our Arctic film makers. And working now very close to Telefilm Canada, we are very grateful for that. Thank you. All right, so we're going to dive into this discussion about storytelling on the land. And like we heard from all of your introductions, the land and language and culture and tradition and ways of living are very, very intertwined for Indigenous people. So I wonder if we can start by speaking about uh, your work as storytellers and what it means for you to, to tell stories on the land or how you consider the land in, in within your storytelling. So uh, maybe we can start with Libby. Mm. So one of the things that um, I learned earlier on, I'm a broadcaster. Uh, my beginning of my career was in broadcasting. So I actually started in radio. And what I found really interesting about that was that um, I wasn't focused on, I, I was standing in places that, you know, it was a privilege to be in. There are large swathes of our country, large parts, parts of Aotearoa, New Zealand, where a lot of people um, don't have access to, and it's not because there's closed gates or, or anything like that. It's, it's because it's a Māori world. And there are places and spaces that many people never um, bother to even look at. They don't know what's beyond um, the track. You know, they go down the track. It's not a, a, you know, it's not a road as such. And so they turn around and they leave and beyond that is where all the magic is laid out. So as a as a young um, radio uh, broadcaster, I was taken to a lot of those places and a lot of very remote and regional places. And um, I think for me, that was the start of my journey um, in terms of a storyteller, because that's where I heard the connection, the strong, unbroken connection. And a lot of us would have... Um, been wrenched away from those places because of the generational change that happened in our grandparents' time post um, World War II, for example, where there was an urban, a large urban drift, and so we'd grown up, you know, in the urban, the urban landscape, and going to Pākehā or white schools or going to places where our language wasn't heard and these stories weren't being told. So we were in a system um, that was my childhood was in a system that did not fit. And like most most of us, as soon as we were transported back to the places where we could actually feel the land, we actually then came in contact with our with our um, family members or tribal members that started to tell us stories. And so they were vastly different worlds. As a child, I remember being absolutely blown away by um, the storytelling that would go long into the night, um, and the and all of the the connections with every part of where we were. And that um, that became a truth for me when I would go to these places as a young journalist and and listen to the stories that and they weren't you know a lot of people like to think that storytelling belongs to our elders. These stories were of people working on the land, working within the land, um, being sustained within the places they were. Um, so these things became they connect reconnected me. Um, to what it was, the stories that we had to tell, and also the protection, the the need we, you know, we needed to take steps to protect this. And so as um, my career moved on and I became involved in television, I was very aware of our footprint on the land when we went into these places with television. In, um, in oral storytelling, radio, you can actually walk very gently on the land. But when you started to take crews in, it became very apparent to me that 
the crews that we were working with at that time were white crews and they had no regard for where their foot, footprint went. They saw it as something that they gathered or grabbed or took uh, in terms of um, the landscape. I mean, I remember being in places where, you know, our 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 my the crew that I was working with would trample over everything and I'd have to be stopping them and saying, this is not your land. You cannot behave like that. I remember the, the looks of horror on the faces of the people whose land we were on. You know, how could you behave like that? Um, and now I find myself in the film industry and, of course, everything is bigger. Everything is bigger. And um, when we started the Māori Land Film Festival, we were very, very aware that we needed to have a sustainability, not a sustainability um, uh, approach wholly, but what we call kaitiakitanga approach. We had to have a, we had to give um, value and credence and awareness to the fact that this is something that we are tasked to take care of, that it doesn't belong to us, it is part of us, and we and we honour it by our actions. And so, with the film festival, we knew um, from going to other film festivals that this is a place that people come. Um, obviously they're going to eat a lot. And so there's going to potentially be a lot of rubbish created. And so we started very early on in the first year of the festival to, to put um, pra practices in place around how we use, uh, how, we, how we walk on the land, how we um, come together on the land, um, what uh, we could do in terms of leaving a zero carbon footprint, um, awareness came of our our Fano or our family in other parts of our um, of our world, our indigenous world, who were feeling the direct impacts of climate change and the storytelling that they brought around that. It all became so very, very real and so very, very, very precious and so very activating. And so we've activated our community uh, within our fil film festival to be proactive and aware of of what they do in terms of the sustainability model that we've um, embedded at the heart of our film festival. But then I turned to film and I've been part of a really exciting project called Greenlit, which is about greening up, um, not greening up, it's actually more than that. It's about the sustainability practices. It's about our responsibility as filmmakers. And it's in, within the very heart of that is the tikanga Māori aspect of it, which myself and others um, work very strongly on, around ensuring that people know that there are values within the Māori world that can be adopted, that we were here long before people started talking about carbon calculators, and we were here long before people started measuring this stuff. It's actually about the basic human ways that we interact with the, within the Thai or the Indigenous, or I call it the Indigenous world, but the, the environment that we were all born into. And so I can talk about that a little bit later because that's just been published. Um, the website has just gone live recently. But all of this conversation um, really, to me, is about uh, the way that we now tell our stories and that we reflect the issues and the very, very um, important issues that are happening, the threats that are happening to the world that we live in. Um, so I'm going to pass it over because I'd like to come back to Greenlit and to um, production um, I'm at, on production at the moment um, here in Wellington and Whanganui Atara, and we've been travelling around to both islands, the, the island of Waipounamu in the south and uh, here on the North Island, and we have been really privileged to be actually standing on the land, the the lands of many of the tribes here, but standing in, in the sort of New Zealand or Aotearoa that people um, across the world uh, think of, and we've actually, you know, we work in those environments, and at the same same time, I've seen the degradation of some of those parts, and that, that's the thing that I'd like to talk to. So, kia ora. Yes, thank you. We're definitely going to return to um, to the effects of climate change um, on our environments as well. But I love that you sort of cut to, I think, kind of the heart of, or one of the hearts of the issue, Libby, is that what we're going to need on a sort of global scale to really address climate change and eco-sustainability is a, a perspective shift or a worldview shift. Um, to that sort of what you might call an indigenous worldview that I think is shared by many, many nations globally, that we're in relation to the land and that it's a reciprocal relation. It's not um, a relationship of dominance and extraction. So I think we really do need to have that perspective change within the industry 
um, to really start to make some some dramatic changes which are needed. So we will come back to that. But first, um, if the rest of the panelists could speak to their work and and what storytelling on the land means in terms of their work. Lisa, did you want to go? Yes, please. So yeah, thank you, Libby. It's so interesting to hear because you are in the other side of the world, but still it's the same, same world and the same problems. I have been I have been going uh, some years ago deeper, deeper in thinking what what is the like a content of Sami films and storytelling and how the land and how we can be different as Finnish, Norwegian, or Swedish filmmakers and storytelling. What what is the different of our way of living, which makes our films and and uh, the whole life. Uh, different and we should know. I started this work with Professor Jim McDonald in the University of the Northern British Columbia many years ago. We we had these kind of public hearings, mostly the Arctic Indigenous Sami people and then the reindeer people <laughs> all, all over the. And I'm not going so deep deep in, but we 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 found out this kind of. Um, some principles which are which are which make different and which make us connecting to the land and for example that we have this uh, geographical extended geographical areas which where we are living which are not only village but it's bigger it's it's extended and they're because the Finnish people, when they came to our area, they were thinking, this is wilderness. You are not here because you you are not here. <laughs> but still, we are fishing, we have our reindeer, we have everything. And we called that Sida. And it was very organized, thousands of years. It was very organized way of living in this area in the northern Scandinavia. Then we had this messenger principle, which is still going on, that we are doing solving our problems together, and then one is going outside with the messenger, message information and coming back. So we are not all saying everything to everybody, but, but we are collective. And that's the community principle that if there is something we have in the nature, we have to sit down together. And then it's the family. To Sami people, the family is everything. Like our name is coming from the family. We know who we are. Then it's the Lago principle. Our homes used to be circle, you know, Lago. So still it's very important that we are sitting around something and uh, and talk. We are not voting. <laughs> Then it's the oral tradition, storytelling, you know. Our story is the starting point and the ending point. Usually it's very important in the films. In our films, not. In our stories, we, it is like a circle. We can jump in and out and in and out and repetition all the time, repeat, repeat, repeat. So that everybody knows the story and then it's going. And then, then nature principle, this sustainable way of living that we have to, we can't cut the last tree or fish the last fish or, you know, we have to uh, live so that the next generation. And then I think the most important is the listening, listening and respecting. Uh, so you have to, Usually you are not living with the calendar. You are going out first. And then, then you make the decision, what are you doing this day? If it's storming, you are not going out. If it's, you know, you have to listen to the nature before you're acting. And you are try to listen to your reindeer <laughs> before you are following them. And then you are trying more and more listen one another before you are talking and acting those are those principles 
I, I have put, and with my work, I'm all the time mirroring, are they there? How it how it's in this film? How can you see? So in that way, our films and our work, way of living is different. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought in that idea of, of circularity, which I think um, applies to many different Indigenous nations again. And again, it, it speaks to that concept of relationality. You know, there's no starting and end point to a circle. It's meant to be able to continue, um, you know, in perpetuity. So when that circle's broken, you know, something goes off on its own path, we start to see those sort of devastating effects. And Harona, I wonder if you could speak to us a little bit about, about your work and what storytelling on the land means to you. Kia ora, um, Thank you for letting me add to the conversation. I was kind of hoping to go after Tainui because <laughs> I know Nick always has a beautiful um, share of, of corridor. Um, I'll, I'll try and fit in where I, where I see the empty spaces, which might, might be good to just flatten everything out. Um, so part of my, uh, where I am in the Horefunua, we, our whanau our area, our, uh, we, own, we own a lake. I guess that's that's the right way of saying it. Um, but really we're the guardians of, of a lake here. Um, and we're one of the only tribes in Aotearoa that um, own a, a beach, so Hokio Beach. Um, again, we're, we don't own it, we're just the guardians and custodians of it. And this is what Lisa's talking about and what Lib Libby's talking about as well is that responsibility of um, the environment around us and how we treat it, what was there before us and um, how do we look after for that sustainability. Um, so Taina and I were talking, and Libby were talking about the mountains that, um, we live we live at the foot of the Tarara Mountains. And the thing with that is that we get the snow up there, the snow mounts, it trickles down, it comes down into the into where we are, um, it comes, you know, into our natural springs. Um, but then we have a lot of farmers that live in this area as well. And it pollutes in, in market gardens and it, it pollutes our waters and our waterways. We've got 1080 drops happening up in the Tarara Mountains. That all feeds and we've got you know dead animals um, that um, end up in our waterways um, and all that tox all that toxic stuff or pollution it ends up into it ends up coming down to into our waters into our waterways and into our lake um, and from there it ends up out into the water and um, we're neighbours here so whatever comes out of whatever's running out into our ocean spreading it right across, you know, down our coastlines, um, down to Kapiti, Whanganui, back to Manuatu, to Taranaki. Um, that's, a <laughs> that's a geography thing. But um, let me get to my point, which is that um, as Indigenous filmmakers, we, we, we have an extra layer of responsibility because we can speak to these things. Whereas our whānau, when we're in these villages, they, we, they live it and we can moan about it. We can try and lobby and petition our, our government. But sometimes a lot of things don't get done. So as filmmakers, we find each other globally and we've got all the same problems. And um, yes, I really wanted to speak about our polluted lake, lake here and, um, and how that affects our traditional practices, which was to eat you know, to, to, to have our food, there was a, a natural, sustainable, um, natural, na well, nature that looked after us. And Lisa was talking about that too. Again, it could be going back to these very old indigenous knowledges. We, we already had these systems in place and sustainability and looking after the land. If there's food, if there's kaimwana um, and fish and bird life, that we used we needed to survive and all that sort of it's um it's it's not in we're not in a good situation right now. However that said um for me the uh, for me the sustainability it feeds into reciprocity and, and how we can 
really pass down our knowledges and do the circular thing and make sure that we are teaching our you know, our babies, our children and our mukapuna, our great grandchildren, how we used to do it back in the day because it's it's really important that we do that because our time on earth is limited and we might be here doing that the big fight and trying to, you know, um keep everything green, to keep to to to, to grow our, our ecosystem. But we might run out of time in, in our in our lifetime. And that's a reality. So being able to pass that down to our next uh, generation is an important thing. Um, and so I guess just circling back to film, um, and Libby spoke about this too, is um, when we go to film on the land, we're very lucky. And I think in New Zealand, we, because we're from so many different tribes as well, we have that luxury of of being able to get in touch with our family, say, "Hey, can we film? Can we film here? Can we film there?" Um, and and for some Māori filmmakers as well, that is a way to connect to to their tribe that they might not know so well. Um, so it's a, it's another way of bridging or reclaiming, um, you know, your old ge genealogy lines, and. That's, that's another form of healing as well. But what it is, is it, it gives you the opportunity to be a platform of, or, or voice for that, for, for your extended whanau, your family that you might not know by using your voice as a filmmaker. And that's really important because that's what I, I got to do that on, um, on my trilogy series, which, which played at Imaginative, The Untold Tales of Tutiki Moana. And we, we, three, we filmed three shows one was filmed in Foxton um, on Fano land. The other was filmed in the Wairarapa on Fano land. And the other one, the third and final film was filmed down south on Fano land. But what I really loved about that uh, process, um, the best thing about it was, was being able to have that, be able to retrace, you know, my steps back to the Fano that were there and to reconnect and say, hey, this is who I am. Um, and these are the stories I want to tell you. And these are my intentions. And and what do you think? You know, and it, and it worked out. And it, it's those are the kind of like we talk about sustainability. It's it was a really beautiful process and opportunity to to be able to find your your whānau that you know you're related to but had no connection or relationship with. And making film is, for me, in the last five years, been a like a really powerful way to reconnect with family. I never knew that film would help me do that because we, we think we do it and we have to do it in other ways. But film has been a, a, a way to, um, I, I think, Take away any sort of you know disconnection of who we who of the different tribes that are around us, and if you're if you're part of that family, you're part of that part of New Zealand. Go back and introduce yourself, and you'll be surprised because if we don't get in there and tell stories and use these beautiful landscapes, these beautiful rivers, the awa, the mountains, the ngahiri, the bird life, the sounds, the skies, you know the 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 taiaul in these areas. It's more than likely that we're going to get these big, these big production companies, these Disney projects, these Peter Jackson projects, you know, coming in, and it's already happened. And uh, you'll see everything beautiful that you see in um, in Maori cinema, or not necessarily Maori cinema, sorry, New Zealand cinema. If it's on the land and it's beautiful, beautiful visual pictures, it's it's Maori land. You know, we're only we only have only been able to see the the environment like that in big international film projects. So it's really good to be part of the generation that's going out there and being able to to um, go and talk to the families on the land and and work with them to make sure that we are the ones sharing our our beautiful environment with the rest of the world. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And I love that you brought in um, 
ways of sort of indigenous filmmaking into the conversation, that collaboration you spoke about, whether it's creative or or speaking to people about permission to film on their land really reflects, I think, what we need in, in terms of that perspective shift, that idea of collaboration instead of private ownership or private profits. You know, we all need to collaborate together to be in relation to the land um, properly. So I love that you created that connection between filmmaking and, and sustainability. And Tanwi, can we have your thoughts, please? Um, kia ora, Adriana. Kia ora, tato. Lots of thoughts, and Lisa and Hiona and uh, Libby raised uh, words that just set off things. Um, I think in this in this business, this storytelling business, we all come to it as individuals, and part of our job as storytellers is to know who we are if we're going to tell the stories that we tell. A lot of our Indigenous stories are about healing, and there's no coincidence about that because a lot of our stories have to do with reconnecting because so many of us, for so many reasons, have been forced away from our tribes, from our lands. And so that act of rediscovery for a storyteller is a healing kind of thing. And for those who have been in the industry for a long time, and I've been doing it for 40 years now, I have a sense of gratitude because my own journey of reconnection has been something I've been able to share with uh, in my work. The Lisa talked quite rightly about the need to listen and to have respect. And in many ways, this is the attitudinal shift we all need as storytellers. New Zealand happens to be a country, yes, we're quite well known for our landscapes, but every country in the world has wonderful, glorious landscapes. No country is more beautiful than another. One reason, though, is that it's only relatively recently that we started to get sound stages and the kind of uh, technology to enable filming inside. So a lot of our filming has been on the land. It's just the way it is. Now, for me, as an Indigenous person, that relationship with the land, uh, I humble myself before the land. We are descended from our mountains. We're part of that circle, that cycle of life. And although I live here in Libby, in my wife's tribal territory and next to Hiona's, um, there's a hole in my heart until I can get back to my own tribal territory and see my own mountain. In part, that's because that mountain has seen my story has seen my story from a young person to now, and it's seen the story of so many people in my tribe. And that just describes to me, in part, the relationship I have with my environment. We are connected. It's in our language. Māori people, we didn't call ourselves Māori. We called ourselves Tangata Penua, people of the land. That gives us the right to connect with the land, and all the brothers and sisters and relations and aunties and uncles and grandchildren that are a part of our wider environment. Our family isn't just the two-legged people we live with. It's everything. And that's an Indigenous perspective that's never going to change and is part of the attitudinal shift that our society needs as a whole. And a lot of that is just simply about respect and listening. Now, um, Yes, it's a very normal thing. New Zealand is a country where our, where our Indigenous population, we're about 18, 19% of the, of the population here. And we can't be ignored. Although we go through the same racism and the same challenges and the necessary reactions to the current right-wing swing around the world, our voice can't be ignored. And uh, so we have stuff to say. And... Part of the beauty of that, in this country at least, we've been able to socialise ideas within our society and within our film culture. Virtually all crews in New Zealand know now you can't just go onto any old piece of land and record unless there's been permission given. And very likely that's going to be from Māori people or from communities. As he on assessed, uh, or refers to, the people who live on the land are a quite different set of leaders. It's been my experience that there are tribal leaders who you ask permission from, but there are also the people who live on the land and who keep the fires burning. They're a different type of leadership. Sometimes the tribal leadership, where you get a bunch of permissions to film, may be at odds with the people on the land. The people on the land may not have voted them in. 
uh, but it doesn't mean to say they won't have respect for them, but you just have to be aware that you just don't go to one bunch of people. You know, uh, in the indigenous world, our notions of leadership and those people who have authority are different. It's not necessarily an elected official. It's someone who may have been an elder and has lived that life all her life on their land. It depends on the circumstance. Um, in the indigenous world, we go by what's happening in this land, what's happening in this space, who are here, how are we going to have a working relationship to tell a story. The thing about the screen industry in part, and it's a, it's a mixed blessing, is that we need ego. And in the Western world, the ego and the creative power of an individual is kind of given a dollar value and it's, you know, it's become a thing. Now, ego is important to an industry because everyone should cherish their own creativity, their own individual individuality. But we also need to have empathy. Without empathy, you don't understand your audience. And so because we have inbuilt relationships with our family, with our environment, we have pathways to communicate. And this is why ritual is so important. One of the things I've found as an Indigenous filmmaker has been the absolute importance of ritual in what we do. We do it in our private life. We have spiritual devotions. We have uh, relations or, 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 or um, ceremonies that we may go undergo in our private life. We should do that on set. We should do that in our professional life as well, because that talks to our relationships with everything and each other. I want to end on a note with a discussion that Lisa and I had in Kaltikeno about four years ago, because it was a matter to do with the environment that actually changed my thinking and encouraged in me an attitudinal shift. And we're all growing up. We all have growth spurts over our lives and realizations come to us. And I had an environmental one that's germane to this discussion as I was sharing a cloudberry liqueur with Lisa in, uh, in Coltecano, and we were talking about a film that she'd been working on, and and some for some reason we talked about the polar bears that were in the back of the shot. That led us to start thinking about, well, those polar bears, they deserve some per diems if they end up in the film. Then we started thinking about maybe they deserve a back end as well. So when I got back to New Zealand and for my next production, I I discussed with my fellow producer and our lawyers a way to include in the contract what I called a putaiao dividend. Putaiao is the word for uh, uh, environment. Um, and it, what it is, is an acknowledgement of all the flora and the fauna, of all the vegetation and the animals and the creatures that take a part in the frames of everything that we do. They deserve some recognition of that. They deserve some respect for being in our shot. Even though we don't get the bears to sign a release form, they're there. And so with the Puthayao dividend, we just arranged for some back end to go to the trustees or the guardians of the areas where we filmed who may have some kind of um, trusteeship over the flora and fauna in their land. And of course, it depends from location to location. Now, that's just one small... Uh, not of respect that I find really exciting in a even just a quite apart from the the beauty of the thought in, in a contractual sense, even just discussing this stuff with the seminars with the hui that we have here, the thought lodges in people's minds. And yeah. so whether it's the Putao dividend or whether it's um, the ritual on set, we need to be very open in articulating who we are and the way we do stuff. We send the ideas out there, they lodge in fertile minds and we socialize them. And it's only over time that we have attitudinal change. Um, and fortunately, um, and unfortunately, we're in a time of crisis where it's very apparent that the safety of the planet is going to depend on indigenous thinking. Thank you so much. That was a great way of putting it. And I love that example of a practical action that you have taken and other people can take to start that, to start that shift. So time is flying by. We have about 10 minutes left. 
I know that uh, Libby and I think Lisa, you did want to touch on climate change. Um, you know, if you can just briefly speak to what you're seeing in your communities or what you've been told and, and those challenges with filmmaking. What are the people on the land seeing? How are their daily lives being affected? Well, I think, okay. oh, you go, Lisa, because you're, you go. No, but, okay. Uh, the latest film we we made the the premiere in the imaginative last week in Toronto. One of the films which were very, I wasn't thinking even that, but the the Saclo Scott from Yellowknife wanted to make a film. The the it was the theme was uh, climate change, and I was thinking, okay, climate change is climate change, yes. But then she said, I'm making a film about the language, our our language and how the climate change is uh, impacting our language. And of course, then I was thinking, yes, of course. And then it happened that her whole, her forest and the, around the yellow knife, it was burning out. And what is happening to the language to the next generations when they they are not having that forest anymore and all the language which is inside the forest and i was thinking what happens if we are losing in samiland our forest or pollute our waters or something how much we lose our language that's also one one point to the climate change discuss yeah Absolutely. A really important point, I think, how, yeah, the, again, speaking to that connection, that vitality that's lost when, when the environment is damaged. And Libby, did you want to, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, um, I think, you know, there's so many naysayers about climate change. And when we bring Indigenous Iwi Taki Taki filmmakers all together around the planet, um, when we get to see each other's work and we see, you know, the that we are actually in the midst, and we have been for a number of decades now, of catastrophe. And, you know, in my early days, we're making documentary films that that hark back to a way of, of being, you know, rediscovering um, for myself um, and for the audience um, practices that, like I said earlier, you know, belonged to another generation. But right now we're in this catastrophe we were actually living and seeing it. So in the film that we've been making, uh, the feature film that we've been making, one of the things that we've, you know, really acknowledged and we do it every day when we start our day is, you know, the climate change is, a, is upon us. We can't predict the weather being spring weather, for example. Um, and we're having those conversations and we're talking to the people whose land we're working on and in and, and doing it um, consciously and doing it as a crew to discuss this and not just sort of sweeping it away and going, oh, that doesn't suit us today because we needed sunshine or we needed whatever. And really making it a conscious um, part of our practice to go, why is this river running the way it's running? Asking the questions as to why, you know, we're there to make a drama piece and it's not about, um, you know, particularly about the way the river's running. But, you know, we're here and we need to ask and we need to dig deeper. And all of those things that, you know, give resonance to your next story to, you know, I mean, for me, it's fire in the belly. You know, it's fire in the belly because I grew up on stories of a certain way of fishing a river that's right next to me. Those, those fish don't run in that river anymore. Um, why don't they run in that river? Because they don't run in that river anymore, because the river is moving, because of the, the desecration that's happening upstream. The, the sand dune is starting to fall apart. You know, the whole ecosystem is crumbling. And in a lot of way that that speaks to, you know, the, 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 the fire in the valley to, you know, we are responsible and that and we are privileged to be on our land um, uh, or to be working on the land, on the whenua. And so with that weight of responsibility, we need to activate that not to be like, we can't do anything. We can do everything. As storytellers, we can now grab a forum, a global audience, win awards at festivals, bring the spotlight to the situation. And Indigenous filmmaking has been doing that 
forever, forever. And as Lisa says, and, and, and we've all said today, you know, our very existence, who we are, is tied up completely um, with our environment. And so one of the other things, and I have to talk about it, and I, I feel um, we all you know, know this, is that we might talk about it, but over here we're not practicing it. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's very um, it's very easy for us to tap into the modern ways of doing things. If you like, you know, the rubbish truck has just driven past and it's picking up the bin with the recycling and the da and the da. But when you're on a film set and everyone's busy and you watch those bins and the rubbish not being separated, to me, that's not giving truth to who we are as storytellers either. You know, we can't be telling the story and not doing the practice. And so I'm, you know, that's another part of. Um, what we're doing with Greenlit, which has three. So Greenlit is about the sustainability, the enduring sustainability, firstly, our relationship to the to the places that we film in, but the relationship with each other and how we practice together um, our responsibilities. So, you know, we have very, as Tainu we said, we've embedded, we're embedding um, these, these practices because the other thing is people are very, they, they, they step away from it. You know, when we were talking about cultural, Māori cultural um, uh, practices being embedded in this New Zealand sustainability, film industry sustainability project, people were backing away. Oh, we can't do that. It's too expensive. Mm -hmm. We can't think about what happens when it goes to, you know, from the recycling plant to the whatever. So in my mind, you don't film if that's, if that's the way you think. If you can't do the practice, then really you're speaking out the side of your mouth you know um so we just the other day we realized you know we have these compostable coffee cups everybody's talking to you know and we're at the unit base and people are talking about well you know i keep forgetting to bring my keep cup so it's simple no keep mm -hmm. cup no coffee the next day all the keep cups in the world arrived you know <laughs> they'd been pulled out of cupboards because they you know coffee and then you think about where the coffee comes from and what's happening to the coffee growers in all of these countries that are affected by this, you know, this, this heating planet. Um, so there's, for storytellers, for us Indigenous storytellers, there are so many stories to tell. And they, there are so many things to tell right now because of what's happening to our planet. Yeah. You know, yeah. and there are still climate uh, crisis deniers. And they need to look at Indigenous film storytelling to realise that, you know, that part of the world that you've never been to, that you think doesn't matter, you know, is the part of the world that is telling you that it's coming your way. Yeah. You know, so we're all involved in this planet. <laughs> yes, it's a great way of putting it. Um, we have just a few more minutes left. Um, I think we have time for one audience question that any of the panelists can answer. And you actually segued beautifully into it, Libby. And that is, what can everyone do to take it further? So maybe producers, filmmakers, Tanwi, you mentioned the clause in the contract. Libby, you mentioned um, not just talking out of the side of your mouth, actually doing it. So what are some practical steps that any of you could share that maybe you've taken or you, others could take as a producer or filmmaker to be more sustainable, more eco-friendly? It's personal work. You have to get to a position where you understand that you are a child of Father Sky and of Mother Earth. We have to get over ourselves as human beings. We aren't dominant over this planet. Our technology and all the wonderful things we do will never change that one jot. We have to humble ourselves before our environment. We have to take that thinking into our work. The camera has to have manners. The camera has to have manners wherever it goes. What we do is more important than who we are. Mm. And all I'm talking about, I guess, whether with regard to political justice, cultural security or environmental health, is that we human beings need to get over ourselves and be humble about our magnificence and humble about our place on the planet. If we don't, well, how do I look at the Haiti? And all it takes is love, true love. Do you mind if I add to, to, to the tail end of what Tyne has just said? Of course, please Which do. Is, 
I think that um, you know we're all, we're all in you know places of importance in terms of uh, within our whānau structure, within our career structures, within our political structures, and it's it's for us to be we could be a little more radical, you know, with manners, of course, <laughs> but it's, but it's you know it's it's really just you know you know um, making a it it's it's these are really easy changes and shifts to make they're not big deals it's like bring your coffee cup to you know set you know and I think the more that we just keep practicing and showing people how how easy it is um it, it, people will start to mirror it and will also, I'm sorry my 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 cutie, my dog is hungry it's breakfast time and he's been very upset with me um yeah I think it's all about just um just doing the mahi be, being a good ancestor, showing people how it's done and, and not being snobby with it as well. Just, you know, just all you have to do is this. It's really easy. And um, and, and like Tony was says, just do it with love. And um, and people will want to be like you. They will want to help. They will want to make a contribution. They will understand. Um, thank you, Libby, for everything you've said. And also to you, Lisa, it's, I'm learning so much. But... Um, Oh, thank you so much. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment to unfortunately end on. I know I could listen to all of you for hours. I thank you so much for all being here and sharing your perspectives and your experiences. As always, it's a privilege to listen to you. And I'm sure the audience got a lot out of this as well. So thank you so much for being here. Kia ora, Adriana. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Kia ora, Lisa. I just want to say thank you so much, a big migwitch for everyone attending today and showing up. And it sounds like you're all guardians of the land and water. And we need to keep listening to the reindeer, Lisa. <laughs> I love that. It's the perfect, perfect thing to end on. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that the next up, we have Writing Climate Futures. Screenwriting in Anthropocene is next. And this workshop will require an RSVP. Following that is our next panel, Circularity in the Design, which is at 3.30 Pacific time. And Craig from Greenlit is participating in the spotlight on Australia and New Zealand. Have a great day, everyone. Mm -hmm.